All right, welcome to the class tonight. We are um, continuing our look at chapters 5 through 8 of Romans. And in our last class, we began to look at what we were looking at, Romans uh, 5, the very last verses of uh, chapter 5. And... We're speaking of the grace that has much more abounded unto us in Christ. And we're going to talk about that even more uh, at the beginning of this class today because we're going to get into the first couple of verses of chapter 6. But before we do, I think it's uh, important that I attempt to, in some small way here, emphasize... um, what we're, that what we're really uh, covering and addressing in these chapters, what Paul is addressing in the writing of these chapters, is really the exceeding and sufficient nature of the new birth, of what it means and how, what it means to be born again. As we've said before in in one of the classes earlier, Paul is dealing with the dilemma and the answer. And he has the dilemma and the answer defined and personified in two men. And we've already looked at how each man determines God's relation to an entire race, an entire creation. And I know this is very difficult to hear, but when, when we were in Adam, when we were born of the corruptible seed of humanity, all we were just born of a natural seed. Throughout your life in that state, under that, um, in that man, as a partaker of the life of that of, of, of Adam and the seed of Adam, that kind, that nature. Nothing you did added one breath to your state of being. From the moment of being born of that seed to the moment if you are to never be born again and you die, Everything in between those two moments in time, nothing you've done in between those two moments has ever accentuated, added to your state of being whatsoever. You are dead, separated from God, in sin, and corrupt from the moment of birth. Why? Because a man had already determined that state. He had already determined the state and condition of an entire creation because he is the head and source of that creation. It's much more so in Christ. And that's why Paul always uses much more. This is much more so in Christ. Because this is a testimony of the reality of grace. This is a testimony that one man in when we are born again. Here's the issue that Jesus presents to the religious man named Nicodemus who comes to him. And here's the main issue. The main issue that he addresses to one of the, one of the higher ups of the Sanhedrin. Who comes to him by night. And the issue that he presents to this man is you must be born again. Why? Because he knows being born again is the answer. Being born again is when the soul is indwelt by and filled and filled with the substance that the man of sin could never have and could never achieve. It's when the soul becomes a partaker of a fullness and a life that the law testified of but could never provide because the absence of life. 
The law had no life in it. It was a description of a life, a testimony of a life, words that gave pictures concerning that life, but it could never provide the life of which it testified. So when we read these chapters, we're talking about the, necess- the, the exceeding sufficiency of new birth where the soul has been taken out of one man and by grace placed in another man altogether. Where the soul is now infilled by a perfect man, a righteous man, a holy man, in whom all fullness resides. And it seems to me that we have, unfortunately, to a great degree, minimized the new birth. And the immensity of that divine miracle of God. And by that I mean that we in many cases, and surely without meaning harm or meaning to it any way, have pointed people beyond the miraculous work of God by which we are born of the Spirit. The work by which the Son of His love, the Christ of God, the, purpose, the person who is the hope of an entire age, comes to reside and live in the soul. Here's a verse, just a one mere single verse to consider the testimony of the sufficiency of the one who presently, if you are born again, dwells in our souls. For Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 12. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. It was the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcised made, circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the body of sins and of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Seems to me important that we Do not, in these verses, overlook the weight that's presented in these words. Paul's describing a sufficient condition, a true state of being that is sure, and is sure as a result of the indwelling of the Son in whom it pleased God for all fullness to dwell. However, it reaches into the very expectation of an entire age, a world, a creation. And we'll see that as we get to Romans 8, the hope of an entire creation. Paul again makes very plain that the expectation that the ages, the mystery, the old covenant with its testimonial elements could not disclose. The object of Israel's hope is Christ in you. The verses we've read is just a further clarification concerning the eternal fullness that the presence of Christ, the presence of the messianic hope himself, the object of hope, has ushered into the soul. So much so that Paul's preaching, he says, is admonishing, warning, teaching in the body of Christ was to declare that those in whom that son lives have presently already arrived at the predetermined goal and destination. Now with, and, and we'll look when, when Paul says in Romans, they that are led by the Spirit are the sons of God. That's what the word led means. It means to be led to a specific destination. Not just led around. With these words, these few verses, they present, and these verses are just present in one letter. We can see how great, I think, the new new birth truly is. The new birth is when everything that God promised, everything that an entire creation and age desired to come, comes and abides in the soul. Religion is set forth and invented, invented so many extras, so many 
uh, additional hopes and that we so many, like a like a dangling carrot out on a string ever before us. And those hopes run the gamut from future expectations, future events, miraculous works, uh, spiritual happenings, the empowerment of the body, the demonstration through the body of some type of spiritual uh, substance. These things that we're still longing for and awaiting the arrival of are nothing more than imagined objects of hope that are due to an absence of our soul beholding the one object of all hope who is now present and living in the soul. The one who resides in the soul as all spiritual blessings bestowed by the Father himself. The revealing of Christ our life that Paul declares as a necessary experience is not something that is unrelated to the new birth at all. And by that I mean it does not, it is not a means for us to receive or acquire something more that was not already provided in the new birth. The new birth is where the soul experiences the deliverance that Paul cries out for in Romans 7. But the seeing of the new birth, and this is, this is, I have it written here, the revealing of Christ is the revealing of the new birth. It is the seeing of the new birth, the seeing of the sufficiency of the indwelling person of our life and salvation, that the deliverance is known to be so and experienced as so. Because we see him who lives and remains and in whom there is nothing lacking, nothing missing, no deficiencies to repair. But we see Jesus is the answer that the Hebrew letter gives us. When man is the question and man is in question and unfortunately man is always the center of the question that religion tries to answer. The only answer to that question concerning man and everything else is we See Jesus. Man is not this. Man is not that, Hebrew says. So he does not say, well, we need to just gather together and pray and have a prayer meeting so that we can finally get that man straight. No, the answer is seemingly to some, the answer is too simple. The answer doesn't seem sufficient. The answer is, but we see Jesus. The revealing of Christ is the revealing of the new birth. The revealing of Christ is seeing, beholding, and experiencing the sufficiency and the completeness that has been fully furnished unto the soul the moment it was born of the incorruptible seed of God. And that's what he's saying here. All of this that was in one man, death, the corruption, sin, by birth, by the seed being present, the very opposite and much more abounding, the grace, righteousness, life and peace and glory and grace are the very results, immediate results of the presence of another man. The Spirit of God is at all times saying to the soul that is indwelt by that man, come and see this man. The seeing of that man, all of our extracurricular hopes and passions and pursuits will be seen to be perverse. Not just unnecessary, but perverse practices of a man that has no faith. So what does that have to do with these chapters? Everything. These chapters are replete with references, allusions to the, to the hope that dominated the lives and the prophetic existence of a people, an entire creation, an age, a world. 
We're going to deal more specifically with that hope as we go into chapter 8, but I think it needs to be addressed for just a moment. The age of testimony was an age declaring a hope, and that hope would be realized and personified in another man, the Messiah himself. The law was never declared as a separate issue from the first man. Paul never makes the law and all of that separate, a separate issue altogether from from man and the Adamic man. The law was put over that man. That man was put under the law. The law was given in direct reference to the man of sin. That sin would be seen, as Paul says in Romans 5 and in Romans 7, to that sin would be seen to be abounding and exceeding. It doesn't mean it made you sin more. It merely exposed you as the sin that you are. And it shows it to be such an abounding thing that there's no hope in that realm. There's no hope to achieve righteousness and produce holiness and to exhibit godliness in that realm. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It's hopeless when in that realm you are attempting to reach the goal that this realm already is. That this man already is. We're going to see that in a moment how that is the pursuit that Paul is addressing here. Because until you see this man, you're going to put all your hope in the wrong man. And this is why chapter 4 of Romans is put in the place that it is. Before we get into the discussion of two men, and after we get into the discussion of how it doesn't matter if they're Jew or Gentile, they're all under sin, they're, they're, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So God had to send another man. To be the propitiation. That he may at this time declare his righteousness and his justification. That he may be just and the justification of those who believe. Because in the fourth chapter of Romans we see a man who is, who is faced with a promise of God concerning a seed. And an inheritance, a blessing that would be brought about in a seed and given. We also see in juxtaposition to that, we see a man who is faced with the barrenness of his own wife's womb and the deadness of his own body. Giving him a hopelessness with regard to such a promise ever being produced by his own power and his own ability. So he comes to the resolute understanding, having given all attention to the deadness of himself and the deadness of the womb of his wife, he gave finally the the understanding, he came to finally the understanding and the resolution that the only one that could perform this is the one that promised it. And it said he hoped against hope. His expectation was in Direct contradiction to his own condition. His expectation was in the power of another. To bring about what he had no capacity to bring about. And what we're seeing addressed here is how God has done such a work. Where he has put away a man that has no capacity with regard to spiritual life. Because in that man there is nothing but sin and death and corruption. And has brought about another man altogether. And in that man there is nothing but perfection and righteousness and justification. And the gift of God is that man to the soul who believes. Sufficiency. The hope of that age, the age of promise, testimony, could never be realized by the man under the law. For the hope of that age would always be fulfilled and embodied in another man. 
The only answer for the soul that was in bondage, in the bondage of sin or in, a, in the sphere of the man of sin, in that realm of death, was to become dead to that man and the corruption of that man and become a partaker of or be born of the seed of another man in whom there is no sin and no corruption. A perfect man. The law's very hope fulfilled. Now, again, we'll talk about that hope more. And so we need to I'll bring this to a, to a close, this part. Paul is actually describing to the Roman believers that such a miraculous work that I've already spoken about. The miraculous work of new birth has already sufficiently come to pass. The fulfillment of hope has already come in those who have believed in and have had faith in the operation of God. Remember what we just read. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. That's, it's a, it's a faith. It's faith beholding the true work of God, the operation of God, that God has raised him from the dead. Remember when Paul's before Agrippa, when he's addressing the hope of Israel, he never makes it anything inseparable to the man God raised. And which man lives in you? Is that not the man that lives in the soul, the one raised, the glorified one? And should it not be not far-fetched for us to say that if that one who Paul declared as the, the risen Christ, who is the hope of Israel fulfilled, shouldn't it, it shouldn't be crazy for us to imagine that the one who's in us, that very son, that very risen Christ, is that hope fulfilled in us? There is nothing beyond the presence of that person that we are to desire and pursue. And that is why there is great necessity of the revealing of him. Because he's there. He's there. And if he's there, his fullness is there. If he's there, everything God had ever promised is there. If he is present, everything that God had in mind eternally is present in you. And God just desires to show you the one who is present. Unveil your heart to the sufficient one who lives in you. Not so that you can do this, this, or this, or become this. No, no, no. You will see him as the become, as what you've always tried to become, as what you want to do, as the manifest reality that you're trying to manifest on a daily basis. You'll see him as that in its absolute sufficiency. And you will not be able to withdraw your heart from the one passion that seeing him will bring into it. And that is, I want to see him and know him. You will never say, I've got it, let's move on to more. No, there's nothing more. And there's nothing more than what's already residing in your soul if you're born of the incorruptible seed of God. Those who have been born of the seed of the risen son. The seed who is the risen son. And in that seed. We do not have a small down payment for something more. We do not have a small down payment concerning the promises given of God. We have all the promises given of God. Yes and amen. Amen. Everything, yes and amen. We're gonna, that's going to be, 
See, that should be the premise from which we pursue the revealing of the Son. Not so we can become anything or reach a goal because we've seen him, but see him as the goal that has been reached. The end that has been given to the soul, the full intention, amen, and will of God realized, gifted to the soul by the Father. For of him are you in Christ who is made unto us. Look at these verses. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4, I think verses 4 through 8, I believe. And this is from J.P. Green, literal version. Listen to the wording to this. Because this says the same thing we're talking about. He says, I give thanks to my God always concerning you. For the grace of God that is given to you in Christ Jesus. That in everything, listen to this word, in everything you were enriched in him. Enriched. Given riches and wealth and substance. In everything. Remember, we're going to read it later. I'm, I'm going into verses we're going to talk about, but we need to reiterate them as much as possible. Look at this. He that spared not his own son, this is Romans 8, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him in that son also freely give us all things? In everything, this is because of the grace given to you, in everything you were enriched in him. He is the full enrichment and the full bestowal of all spiritual blessing to the soul. In all discourse and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you by the very presence of him. So that you're not lacking in any gift. Not spiritual gifts. We're not talking about spiritual gifts. We're not talking about the things that we've imagined to be gifts so we can exalt ourselves or others can look at us and see something spiritual. We're talking about the gift, the grace. This is the word grace. You come behind, you lack nothing in this grace. That's an absolute statement. There's no condition there. It means because of the enrichment that has taken place in him, the grace that has been bestowed of the Father, you have no lack. There's nothing deficient in the salvation that is present in the soul if you're born of that seed. Because in him dwells all fullness. But look, you lack nothing in any gift. You're lacking nothing at all as you are awaiting the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who also in that revelation will confirm you until the end. Meaning he will confirm your soul as having reached the goal. When you see him there is a confirming of the fact that the fullness is present. There is a confirming of the fact that you have come to the end. It's not a further uh, um, encouragement to us to reach the end. No, no, no. The revelation of the Son is when the soul is con it's confirmed in the soul, the end has come. And He is in you and has been in you from the moment He's come to dwell there. A finished work is the finished work, and He's in you. Come and see this man. This is the sure ground. The word here, come behind, means to fall short, to lack anything, to be in want of, to suffer lack, to be devoid of, to be lacking anything that is excellent. You're not, you haven't come behind. You're not lacking at all. As you are waiting. These are those who are in, uh, in, inexperienced in or without experience of. It's not that they don't have it because the grace has come and they're enriched. 
in him, but they haven't seen him yet. This is Colossians 3. The life that is there, the life that is hid with Christ in God must appear. The life is present, but must appear. You must see another man because until you see the perfect man, all your hope and false hope at that will rest upon the wrong man. And you'll try to find evidence in that wrong man what is only beheld in the presence, the revealed presence of the perfect man. Christ is not a pattern for the, for the imperfect man, the man of sin and death, to try to imitate. If we see the division he's making here, look at it in the fruit of the spirit and the works of the flesh. That's the same two men being addressed there. And see how impossible it is for this man of sin to impersonate this man of spirit or ever achieve that goal. Be like him. Express him. He is his own evidence. The Spirit of God desires you to see him as the evidence and the substance. This is the abounding grace that we addressed in the end of chapter 5 that is bestowed in the beloved Son. This is the abounding grace and the sufficient life that has been gifted to the soul simply and solely because the man of all fullness and perfection lives in that soul. The hope that we have in this testimony, the hope that God had placed an entire creation in or subjected an entire creation in could never be known until it is fully and completely known in the, in the man who is always the object of its hope. Because until that man is observed by the faculties of the soul, we will still have hope in the barrenness of the man of flesh. And we'll attempt to remedy the perceived lack by attempting to have God bestow his grace to a man to whom grace is never intended and to whom it is never applicable. And this is where we go into chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to repeat what I just read, and then we'll get into this, because this is the issue that Paul is addressing. He's not talking about people who want to, to, to go out and do a lot of sins, and do a lot of sinning, and be bad people, and then have God, God still love them. That's not what he's addressing. This is all connected together. This is about what he's going to say and use his own personal experience in Romans 7. And the deliverance that he speaks of in Romans 8. It's about a man trying by the law to have the perfect man become the... Uh, the expressed image of, or the wrong man become the expressed image of the perfect man. And to utilize the testimony and description of a perfect man to bring it about. And the problem is that there is a difference in kind and seed and that it's never going to be transferred from Christ to us. There is not that transference. That's what, what happens and we try to get God to just transfer it from Christ to us. No, there's been a translation out of one man into Christ. And now the soul must know the one in whom it lives. The life that has been bestowed. If not, again, here's, here, let me read this. We will attempt, if we do not behold... By the, with the faculties until the right man is beheld by the faculties of the soul... That's the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, the veil being removed from the heart. We will still have a false hope in the barrenness of the man of flesh. 
And we will attempt to remedy that perceived lack by attempting to have God bestow his grace to a man to whom grace is never intended and to whom it is never applicable. The grace of God does not empower the man of flesh. The grace of God is that we have been taken out of the man of sin, that we are dead to the man of sin and the earthly man and the man of the earth, the man of corruption, that seed, that kind. And another man altogether, a man who is the perfection of God, the intention of God realized, comes and lives and is made unto the soul everything God demands and desires. Because this is what we're talking about in Romans 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? Again, remember, he's just made these distinction between two men. A man in, of sin and a man in whom an entire creation is known of God to be dead and in sin, dead in sin and separated from him. Because sin is not things you do. Sin is a man. Sin and death is embodied and personified in a man, the Adamic man, the man of flesh. It's not saying, shall we go on and do sins and commit sins so that God's grace will continually abound to us because we do a lot of sins? That's not what he's addressing. He's again dealing with this man attempting to achieve a relationship with God that is not his and does not belong to him. Because relationship with God belongs to another man altogether. That's why the spirit of the son has to be given to the soul by which we cry out a father. Because it is not God giving man a relationship with himself. It is God giving the man into, to the soul who has eternal fellowship with him. That is unbroken and unbreakable. So we continue in sin that grace may abound. This is chapter 3. Let's go back to that. Verse 9, what then? Are we better than they, meaning the Jew over the Gentile? No, in no wise. We have before proved that both Jews and Gentiles, they are all under sin. Why? Because no matter the distinctions of the flesh, no matter the divisions that we've divided up in the flesh and made this division holier than this division of the flesh, it's still the same man. Doesn't matter. That's why Paul says in Christ, circumcision, uncircumcision, none of that matters. Why? Because the man who believes that circumcision and uncircumcision gives him some kind of approach to God or not is not there. That man has no place here. The grace of God has not brought this man into Christ and made him acceptable. No. Look at this. They are all under sin, Jew or Gentile. There is none righteous, not one. Why? Because there is, that man has no righteousness in him. And you can, you can argue with that and you can argue with that statement all day long. And you can, he says there's none that understands. There's none that seek God. And you can argue with those statements and give him all of the hours that you pray and seek God. And you can show him all the books you've written and say, see this, I understand. Not one. Man, in his flesh, the Adamic kind, no matter how religiously trained he is, the man who is governed by the mind of the flesh does not seek God and does not understand God. That man cannot. It is undiscernible to him, for it is spiritually discerned. He can't achieve it, he can't know it. 
The only seeking that we do in our flesh as, as long as we're living, believing that God will fix the situation of the Adamic man, we are trying to get God to bestow his grace. Let Ishmael live before you. That's what we're after. God's grace is only one man lives here. Only one man. There's only one condition. There's only one state. There's only one life. The grace of God is not bestowed to a man of sin. This is Galatians 3, verses 3 through 5. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Having begun in the spirit, having begun in Christ, where all perfection abounds, are you now in the flesh going to further perfect what is already perfect? This is what he's saying here in chapter 6. So we're going to see all of this as, as we go through chapter 6. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Isn't that what he's talking about in Colossians chapter 2? The same thing. He's saying the exact same thing in Colossians chapter 2. Let no man beguile you. Or let me, let me start here. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink, respect of a holy day or in the new moon or in the Sabbath days. There is shadow of things to come, but the body is Christ, is of Christ. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and a worshiping of angels, intruding into things which he has seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands, having nourishment ministered and knit together, increase with the increase of God. Wherefore, if you be dead with Christ from the rudiments of the world or an age, why, as this is, if you be dead with Christ from that age, and the man who was under that age, why, as though living in that age, are you subject to these ordinances? Touch not, taste not, handle not. Before that, in, in verses 11, after what we read earlier, complete in him who is the head of all principality and power, he says this in verse 11, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. That's an entire body being put away, a body of sin, a body of flesh. It's not just stopping sins and sinning. It's talking about the cutting off and putting away of an entire man. But as long as that circumcision is not known by seeing the perfect man, we will attempt to walk into the shadows of the testimony and make them applicable to a man that they were never applicable to. To try to reach a goal that Christ already is. And you're dead to that. Since you are dead, seeing that you are dead to that world, to that age, to that man, why are you still living as though there is any validity to it? Set your heart to see your life. See the grace bestowed. Do not try to get the grace of God to be brought into a realm that it does not apply to. It's what he's saying in Romans 6. How shall we who are dead live there any longer? Know you not so many of us as were baptized 
into, his, uh, into Christ or baptized into his death. See, his death was a death that put off the man of sin. His death was where he took away the first so that he could be risen and glorified as the full establishment and embodiment of the second. As we go on in these verses and in these chapters, we're going to look more at Rome, uh, 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to see that this is exactly what he's referring to because we've already said when you're looking at these chapters, you're looking at the resurrection being declared. You're looking at a, the resurrection being declared where the corruptible puts on incorruptible, the mortal puts on immortality. It's not about an enhancement of mortality, it's about the putting off of one and a new coming all together. Another coming all together. And in the coming of that one, sin and death and the law are dealt with. Because you've put on one in whom there is no sin, no death. Death hath no more dominion over him as we're going to see in chapter 6. Because the law has no hold and cannot bring accusation and condemnation to that man. He's perfect. Lacking nothing. And if he lives in you, we go back to what he said in we go back to what he said here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. If you are given the grace of God in Christ and have in him been enriched fully, then you lack nothing regarding any thing of the grace of God, any sufficiency of the grace of God. What does he go on and say? What is that about? Of God are you in Christ Jesus, who is made unto us. See, that's the wisdom of God. As we've said in an earlier class, that's the wisdom of God that David says, you desire me to have, you desire truth in the inward parts. Teach me wisdom in the heart. Teach me your wisdom in the inner man. What wisdom? Of God are you in Christ who is made unto you. That's the wisdom that the Jew cannot know. The Gentile cannot know because it's foolishness to him. It's foolishness to the man of flesh. When you're declaring another man altogether. And the sufficiency of a, a new life. That Paul says that we may walk in newness of life. That's another life. That's not a renewing of your life or, or giving you some new lease on life. Another chance for Adam. It's about a new life altogether. And that life is present and that life is accounted for and there is nothing missing or lacking or deficient in that life. That life is absolutely perfect. And the Spirit of God desires for you to know and see the one who is that life. Otherwise, we will call for God to bestow his grace to the one to whom grace is not applicable. Now we've introduced this thought and that's just an introduction. Let me read a couple things and then we'll, we'll stop. Again with reference to Romans 6 uh, verses 1 and 2. And this is just kind of a restating of some of the things that we've said seems that Paul here is not addressing a desire to merely continue to do sinful acts so that God will continue to bestow his grace. The sin and the grace seems to point to something much more significant. 
very closely relating to Jesus' statement to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Jesus had exist, Jews had existed forever under the assumption that they had an unbreakable fellowship with God due to their birth. But as soon, but as we have, sorry, as we have covered, their natural birth was through the natural corruptible seed. Thus, they could never actually realize all that they had assumed they had right to in that state. But they used their lineage and their observance of the law to assure themselves of their place before God. So the issue for Jesus was new birth. So the seed of God, the seed in who, unto whom all things were, un, were given would be birthed in the heart and in that birthing all things would be received and experienced in the presence of that seed of promise. But see, their continued desire to hold on to the outward evidences of the law, just like we imagine and desire outward evidences of spirituality. They desired that, and yet they embraced the benefits of the grace. They wanted holiness, and they wanted righteousness and perfection. And those two things, those two things, will never work together. Spirit and flesh. That's what Paul calls it in Galatians 5. The flesh and the spirit will not work together. They are enmity one of another. They are contrary one to another so that you cannot do that which you would. What do you desire to do? What, wrong, what, what Paul will declare and, and com, confess that he was attempting to do under the law. See, we're not talking about the obligation of a Christian to live and struggle like this. We're telling you if you're born again, the perfect life resides in you. The grace of God has been bestowed. You have been delivered from one man to another. You've been delivered from death unto life, darkness unto light, Adam unto Christ. Let the perfect man appear. Turn and see the perfect man. Because until he appears and becomes the occupation of your heart's perspective, you will believe the grace of God is unto the wrong, is unto the man of flesh. And we're going to cover this more as we go. We're covering this more in our next class. But I wanted to reiterate and I wanted to at least emphasize in this class and, and poorly I know it was done. But if the seed of God is present, if the seed of God resides in the soul, you are lacking nothing with regard to sufficiency. Because he is your sufficiency. He determines your state. And the revealing of Christ is so your soul will know and be confirmed in that perfect state. So, we'll stop there. We'll pick up in our next class. Appreciate you uh, and your patience listening. If you have any questions, you can uh, email us. I'm glad to get back with you. Thanks again for being with us tonight. Uh, the conference again, the summer conference is coming up at the end of June, the 26th of June through the 30th. So if you guys are planning on coming and would like to, uh, there's an announcement on the website now, on the home page. You go there. The 24-7 screen is there. Go underneath it. and Isn't that where it is? Right around there? Okay. Uh, it's underneath it, and you'll see the, the announcement for the conferences, and it has some places to stay there. 
uh, as well that you can call, phone numbers and, and such. And uh, if you need any further assistance and help, you can give us a call. You can email us at cmibrc at yahoo.com. Uh, there's also phone numbers on, the, on that announcement. And we'll do what we can to help you with, with whatever else you need. So, again, thanks for being with us tonight. We'll be back with you in a couple of weeks. Amen.